So you can hear me? Yeah. Great. Translation. I have thus explained to you the gross, material, gigantic conception of the personality of Godhead. One who seriously desires liberation concentrates his mind on this form of the Lord because there is nothing more than this in the material world. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. In the Bhagavad Gita 9.10, the Supreme Personality of Godhead has verily explained that the material nature is only an order-carrying agent of His. She is one of the different potencies of the Lord, and she acts under His direction only. As a Supreme Transcendental Lord, He simply casts a glance over the material principle, and thus the agitation of matter begins, and the resultant actions are manifested one after another by six kinds of gradual differentiations. All material creation is moving in that way, and thus it appears and disappears in due course. Less intelligent persons with a forefront of knowledge cannot accommodate the thought of this inconceivable potency of Lord Sri Krishna, by which he appears just like a human being. Bhagavad Gita 9.11 His appearance in the material world as one of us is also his causeless mercy upon the fallen souls. He is transcendental to all material conceptions, but by his unbounded mercy upon his pure devotees, he comes down and manifests himself as a personality of God. Materialistic philosophers and scientists are too much engrossed with atomic energy and the gigantic situation of the universal form, and they offer respect more seriously to the external phenomenal feature of the material manifestations than to the noumenal principle of spiritual existence. Actually, I think it's nominal. It's nominal or nominal, anyway. Uh, the transcendental form of the Lord is beyond the jurisdiction of such materialistic activities. And it is very difficult to see that the Lord can be simultaneously localized and all pervasive because the materialistic philosophers and scientists think of everything in terms of their own experience. Because they are unable to accept the personal feature of the Supreme Lord, the Lord is kind enough to demonstrate the Irat feature of his transcendental form. And herein, Sri Shukadeva Goswami has vividly described this form of the Lord. He concludes that there is nothing beyond this gigantic feature of the Lord. None of the materialistic thoughtful men can go beyond this conception of the gigantic form. The minds of materialistic men are flickering and constantly changing from one aspect to another. Therefore, one is advised to think of the Lord by thinking of any part of his gigantic body. And by one's intelligence only, one can think of him in any manifestation of the material world. The forest, the hill, the ocean, the man, the animal, the demigod, the bird, the beast, or anything else. Each and every item of the material manifestation entails a part of the body of the gigantic form, and thus the flickering mind can be fixed in the Lord only and nothing else. This process of concentrating on the different bodily parts of the Lord gradually diminish the demoniac challenge of godlessness and bring about gradual development of devotional service to the Lord. Everything being part and parcel of the complete whole, the neophyte student gradually realizes the hymns of the Isha Upanishad, which state that the Supreme Lord is everywhere, and thus he will learn the art of not committing any offense to the body of the Lord. This sense of God-mindedness will diminish one's pride in challenging the existence of God 
Thus, one can learn to show respect to everything, for all things are part and parcels of the Supreme Body. Om Agyanati Nirandasya Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshami Vitani Nantasvai Shri Varvena So, um, for anybody who's looking at the screen share, you should see a PowerPoint. I have 14 slides that I've made that hopefully will help a little bit in uh, my understanding of this verse, or to relate my understanding of this verse. So, um, if we were asked to explain what this verse means to us, I would say that Shukadeva Goswami is explaining to Maharaj Prichit that it's not that the world is without a purpose. It has not come about by accident. Rather, it is owned and controlled by the Lord. It's one of His energies. And in fact, this cosmic manifestation which we can perceive with our senses, is a form of the Lord. So by understanding through our intelligence, mana, sva, buddhya, by the use of the intelligence, we can fix the flickering mind on this form of the Lord. And because, na, yato, sti, kin, shit, because there's nothing beyond the Lord, by fixing our mind it, on the universal form in relationship to the Lord, we can realize the Lord. Just as much as if there is a fingerprint on a crime scene, you can tell who did it. If there's tracks in the ground, you can tell which animal was there. Similarly, by studying the cosmic manifestation of the Virat, we can understand the cause, the source of the Virat, and therefore become qualified to realize God in one of his aspects, which will make us more qualified for further advancement. So, Srila Prabhupada, in the purport, I'm not going to explain the slides, just anybody that um, can't see these, you can see a video later on if you're interested. But next slide. Um, Srila Prabhupada in the purport quotes from the Bhagavad Gita, uh, ninth chapter, text number 10, and then later on he quotes text 11. So in text 10, Krishna explains how he is the superintendent of this world. Uh, Maya adakshena prakriti. Uh, adakshena means that there is a superintendent. Krishna says, Maya Dakshina, I am the superintendent. This is my energy. Superintendence is, uh, comes from a Latin word, uh, super and then intendere, which means to direct one's attention, basically. So uh, this is uh, further elaborated how Krishna superintends. Uh, it, again, the Latin is super intendere simply by one's attention something is executed so in the Svetas Vatara Upanishad there's a verse parasha shaktir vivadaya shriyate excuse me swabhaviki jnana bala kriyacha so parasha shaktir means that Krishna does everything by his supreme potencies some of those potencies are Jnana Shakti, Bala Shakti, Kriya Shakti, his knowledge, potency, his potency of action, his potency of power, and they're all Swabhaviki. That means that it's spontaneous, without any kind of endeavor on his part. Simply, he wills, and everything is carried out with the, the least concern or endeavor from the Lord. Uh, so there's this nice picture of uh, Maya Devi 
in yellow, red, and purple uh, with the, uh, uh, like a marionette controlling the puppets. So one puppet is thinking that he's controlling the other puppet by making him work, but actually they're both, they're both controlled. Some are controlled by mode of goodness, some are controlled by combination of goodness and passion. They're all controlled, but simply their thinking uh, is wrong. So Krishna says, Hey tu nanena kaunteya jagat divari partite. Uh, that I am the controller, I am the Ishvara. Uh, the cause is me. So this is exactly opposite of what the demoniac think. The demoniac think, asatyam uh, aparishtam te jagadahur anishuram. So here's the next slide. Uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes the demoniac nature. He says, Te Jagat Ahur, about this universe, they say, they declare that it is asatyam, that is unreal. Uh, just like the Mayavati philosophers, <coughs> they describe this world as mitya, unreal. However, in the verse that we're studying now in the Bhagavatam, it doesn't say that at all. Krishna, uh, in this verse, Maya Dekshena Prakriti and the Jigadev Goswami confirms uh, Nayata Astakinchit, that there is nothing other than the Supreme Lord. Even though the demons say it's unreal, uh, they say also that it's Apratishtam, that means no foundation. Just like if you have a building, it has no foundation and there's nothing holding it up. In other words, there's no shelter. Uh, they also say, an Ishvaram. There's no controller. Nobody's at the helm. Uh, we just had this big cyclone that hit the Philippines. <clears throat> and, and as soon as, uh, because it was so severe, they released all the criminals from the jails. As soon as that happened, they went around raping people. Uh, creating havoc, uh, pilfering, um, vandalizing. The same thing happened with when uh, Hurricane Katrina came through. Uh, people would go to these shelters, like they have football fields, auditoriums, etc. And uh, big and gangs would roam rampantly, raping women, harassing people, stealing, do whatever they like. So as soon as there's no as soon as there's no controller, then everything is up for grabs. You can do whatever you want. That is the demoniac mentality. But in the verse we're studying now, it says, Iyan uh, asau Ishvara vigrahasya. No, there is an Ishvara. There is a controller. Uh, yet the demons say, uh, ap, uh, Aparaspa, which means without cause, and Sambhutam, which means it has risen by chance. Aparaspa <coughs> sambutam. Just like the bang, Big Bang Theory is the latest speculation that has been in vogue for the last few decades. That spontaneously there was a, an explosion, and from that explosion over billions and trillions of years, everything has come about. That is not what this verse says. This verse says, Nayata Astikinsha. There is nothing but the Supreme Personality of God. Uh, and then lastly, they say, uh, that Kim Anyat Kama Haitukam. That there's no other purpose, therefore, since there's no controller, since there's no foundation, because everything is unreal and it's all arisen by chance without cause, therefore, there is no other purpose than to satisfy our, our lusty desires, our senses. In the 60s, where, uh, as I grew up, uh, I grew up on television, and there was uh, a commercial that summed up very nicely the materialistic mentality. It said that you only go around once in life. 
So therefore, grab all the gusto you can get. Uh, so I have a little picture. It's Miller time. Um, this actually, in a nutshell, describes the demoniac mentality. Uh, however, even those in the mode of goodness who are seeking after God, they also are bewildered if they only can rely on their senses. Here we have a quote from Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theologica, <coughs> which he, uh, it's a brilliant work that was written for the Christian church, but even here he says that we cannot know what God is, but rather what he is not. We have no means for considering how God is, but rather how he is not. So, even in the mode of goodness, those endeavoring for perfection, without the guidance of the disciplic succession, bona fide spiritual master, and without a tinge of bhakti, simply relying on their own sensual perception, the utmost they can come to is the Brahman realization. Just as in the Upanishads, it's stated, neti neti, that the absolute truth is near Guna Brahman. In the Svetas Vatara Upanishad, there is a verse, it's 319, that states, Apani Pado Javino Grihita, which means that the absolute truth has no hands, he has no legs. That's how it's described. However, through further inspection, you know, in the Ishopanishad it says, Tad Ejti, Tad Daijti, Tad Dure, Tad Avyatike, that the Supreme Lord, although he has no legs, he walks faster than anyone. And although he's very far, far away, he's very near as well. So when it refers to the Supreme Lord has no hands, has no legs, has no material qualities, he's near Vishesh, that means he has no material qualities. He is Savishesh, but those are spiritual qualities. So going to the next slide. Um, in Shiva Prabhupada also cites the next verse after Maya Dakshina Prakriti. Then the next verse is Avajananti Mudha Manusim Tanum Ashutam. That when I, Krishna says, when I accept a human form, uh, then those who are less intelligent and are just like have the intelligence of an ass, they deride me. Krishna has his transcendental pastimes. And just like if you have a very, very rich person, he has no need to do anything than enjoy himself. And you will find, you know, like, let's say, you know, somebody born in a rich family or aristocracy, they generally will play, uh, many of them will turn into playboys because they simply want to enjoy themselves, no need to work. So the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he has his pleasure pastimes where he plays with his associates. No need to be concerned with working like the image of Atlas, trying to hold up the world. Uh, no, those are all done by his energies. Parasha Shakti Vivadaya Shruti. But those who are less intelligent, even though they think that they're intelligent, this is their foolishness. They try and understand this world. And when they're, they see or hear about the past times of the Lord, they don't accept them. They become husbands. These are mudhas. Therefore, in the, the purport, Srila Prabhupada very nicely says, materialistic philosophers and scientists are too much engrossed with the atomic energy, you know, on a small scale, or in the gigantic scale, the gigantic situation of the universal form, and they offer respect more seriously to the external phenomenal feature of the materialist, material manifestation than to the nom nominal principle of spiritual existence. I don't know how to pronounce that word, I have to look it up, but anyway, 
um, let's see, here in the next slide. Let's see the pronunciation guide. Anyway, so uh, nominal. It's like we have the phenomenal world and then we have nominal uh, existence. So nominal comes from, uh, again, a Greek word meaning uh, perception, uh, understanding, or the mind. And it's roughly translated that uh, uh, nous means something that is thought or perceived with the mind by the intelligence uh, of the philosophical thought. Uh, this comes originally from the Plutonic idea that there's a world of ideas uh, that... Uh, actually, I, I would like to read this. Um, I, I hope you don't mind. I, I thought it very interesting. Um, this is a little something I got from the Wikipedia on the philosophical understanding of nominal as opposed to phenomenal. Um, nominon is a positive object or event that, if known at all, without the use of the senses. The term is generally used in contrast with or in relationship to phenomenon, which refers to anything that appears to or is an object of the senses. In the Plutonic philosophy, the nominal realm was equated to the world of ideas known to the philosophical mind in contrast with the phenomenal realm, which is equated with the world of sensory reality known to the uneducated man. Um, I'm sorry, uneducated mind, sorry. Now, this is important. <clears throat> Much of modern philosophy has generally been skeptical of the possibility of knowledge independent of the senses. And Immanuel Kant gave this viewpoint its classical version, saying that the nominal world may exist, but is completely unknowable to humans. So, again, I want to read this first, about this sentence that Shirley Prabhupada is saying in the purport. He says, materialistic philosophers and scientists are too much engrossed with atomic energy and the gigantic situation of the universal form, and they offer respect more seriously to the external phenomenal feature of the material manifestation than to the nominal principle of spiritual existence. So, uh, this was given... Uh, a classical version by Immanuel Kant. So he's saying that even if the if there's something beyond our senses, since we can't perceive it, it's not knowable to human beings, so therefore it is not of no consequence. Therefore they give more stress to what they can perceive with their senses. Uh, now I wanted to read a passage here. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't flip the slide. There you go. This is a passage from the preface of the Brahma Samhita by Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur that I wanted to read. People are so much apt to indulge in transitory speculation even when they are to educate themselves on a situation beyond their empiric area or experiencing jurisdiction. The esoteric aspect often knocks them to trace out the eminence in their outward inspection of transitory and transformable things. This impulse moves them to fix the position of the eminent to an indeterminate impersonal entity, no clue of which could be disturbed by moving earth and heaven through their organic senses. Uh, I thought this is wonderful. Um, when I first uh, came in contact with this passage, when Srila Prabhupada read it uh, as an introduction to the Rama Samhita, I couldn't understand a word of it. But after reading the Srimad Bhagavatam, now we're getting more of an insight on what exactly Srila Bhaktivedanta is so eloquently speaking about. So those who are materialistic philosophers and scientists, they indulge in transitory speculation, just like we were reading recently about the phases of the moon being an aspect of the universal form because they're always changing. Similarly, 
in the minds of men, sort of speculating constantly, trying to figure out this world, that, and they're ever-changing their theories. Uh, he says that the empiric area of, or experiencing jurisdiction, in other words, we have limited perception, no matter how we improve our instruments of perception, still we're limited by our senses. It doesn't matter what kind of machine we make to extend our senses, it's still the senses themselves are, are limited. So therefore, they, uh, it moves them to fix the position of the imminent to an indeterminate, impersonal entity. So, just as we were pointing out before, even those in the mind of goodness who are trying to understand the absolute truth, relying on their sense perception, their mind and intelligence, at the utmost they can come to impersonal Brahman realization. Uh, imminent uh, is a word that's used in philosophy, it has several meanings, but at least as far as uh, Christianity, in, a, uh, in a terms of the class, uh, ecclesiastical terms, it, uh, it's related more to pantheism, or conception of God as being throughout the universe. Uh, generally, uh, imminent is used in connection with transcendent. You know, can you perceive God acting within the world, or is it completely transcendental? to it so that we cannot perceive him. Let me go to the next slide here. So, the conception of the virat is to help materialistic persons so that they can realize God in some aspect. Uh, because we are limited by our sense of perception, so how can we perceive the unlimited? Uh, that is through the use of the intelligence, mana buddhya, by utilizing our intelligence to direct the mind, we have a chance to understand the Supreme. Therefore, we are studying this, this virata rupa. In the, um, I believe it's like this Vatara Upanishad, I have the verse written here, but uh, it's recorded in Madhya Lila. Uh, and there's a nice example that is given about how the Lord pervades this universe in His eminence. It says that Eka Desha Sita Syagner Josnisna Jotisna, sorry, Vishtarini Yata Parasha Brahmana Shakti Tataidam Akilam Jagat. What this means is that just as fire is situated fixed in one place, and yet it spreads its energy, its heat and light everywhere. Similarly, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is fixed and immovable, yet through His multifarious energy, He manifests Himself throughout His creation, which is perceivable to our senses. So, here just to very quickly go through the next few slides, and then we'll end. Um, uh, I just chose one verse you know, describing the universal form. For instance, uh, here we have the demigods. The demigods headed by Indra's arms. Uh, the ten directions there, the ears, and then the physical sound is a sense of hearing. You know, you think about whales and dolphins, uh, even like uh, modern submarines, they have uh, sonar. Even blind people sometimes they can, like, they use clicking sound, and from the clicking sound, they can get what their bearings are. So, the universal form, whenever we think uh, of the directions or the sense of sound, we can understand it's simply a part of the universal form. These two nostrils are the Ashwini Kamaras, and material fragrance is the sense of smell. His mouth is blazing fire, etc., uh, etc. Uh, you know, just like fire can devour anything, you know, so like when there's an atomic blast, uh, people will evaporate, and all you can see is their shadows left on the sidewalk. So, fire is so powerful, and it's simply a representation of the universal form of the Lord. So, in closing, what this verse uh, means to me is that this world 
has not come about by accident or without a purpose. It's owned and controlled by the Lord, as stated in the Ishopanishad, Ishavasya Midam Sarvam. Uh, there is a controller, and he owns everything. This is his energy. Uh, and in fact, Iyanasau uh, Ishvara Vigrahasya, it's simply one of his forms. Uh, and then, therefore, the materialistic person, by the use, by utilizing his senses, mana sva buddhya, he can direct his mind through his intelligence to understand this form of the Lord. And, um, uh, you know, like dharana, dharana is a, means concentration of the mind. It's one of the, I think, the fifth and the eightfold mystic yoga system. So, sandhya one can uh, concentrate his mind and intelligence. Sandaryate asmin bapusi stavishte. He can concentrate on the form of the virat, which is stavishte. Stavishte means gross, it's gross material element. So we can actually realize the supreme. It's a bona fide rep, uh, method of God realization. We can realize the supreme through his energies. This is a man is known by his creation. You know, if we were to uh, take a painting, you know, Picasso or whatever, uh, you can take it to an expert and they can tell by each stroke if it's a genuine Picasso. Similarly, by studying scrutinizingly, if we're expert, we can understand the origin of this world by understanding the Virata Rupa. So I am going to stop at this point um, and switch over to my telephone. So this will just take a minute. Yuglaras, in the meantime, you can unmute everybody while I'm trying to switch over to my telephone. Okay, it'll just take me a minute here. I'm almost there. Okay, okay so can you hear me now? Echo, okay, well, I've got to add it one of my sources. sources. Just, Just one second. second. There. Now I'm only on my telephone. How do I sound? Do I sound okay? Hmm? Okay, so now as I walk over, I'll probably speak a little bit louder. But um, so that was the end of my presentation. Now I'm free to, you know, or all of you are free, if you'd like to have any kind of discussion or if anybody has any questions or comments, and please go right ahead. Ramananji, I'd like to um, ask a question, sort of devil's advocate. Um, a poke at your, at your argument here that by studying the material nature we can understand so much about God. Um, you gave the example you know, of a fingerprint or a footstep. So if, oh by the way, let me, let me one other little thing. You're talking about a phenomenal and the, the word is noumenal. I'm not in front of my computer right now or I've got a dictionary, but that word is noumenal. Phenomenal and noumenal. Phenomenal means that which we can perceive through our senses. That which is so it's not gro nominal. grossly nominal. that which is grossly evident. Noumenal means that which we cannot perceive through our senses. Something more esoteric that we're not able to perceive through the senses would be considered noumenal. So Krishna tells Arjuna about the phenomenal and the noumenal. But anyway, um, no, that's just. Uh, Little, little point. Um, okay, now let's say, let's say God is so so great, we are so so small. Now let's let's take for example an ant. 
Now, the difference between us as humans and an ant, I would assume, is infinitely less distant than the distance between the jiva and God. I mean, God is totally infinite. And, you know, it's inconceivable. And, but let's take the difference between us and an ant. If an ant were to, say, crawl into our house and look down, maybe the ant crawled inside of, of, a, of our computer. How is this ant, by walking across a, you know, a, a, uh, the, the, the inside of a computer, walking across the board, walking across the processors, how is he going to understand anything about us? If he walked into my, our wardrobe or, or walked across from a, a shoe or a shirt, or if he across, came across or walked across a telephone or, or climbed across the refrigerator or the microwave, how is this ant, by seeing evidence of us, going to understand anything about us? It seems it's too, it's too distant. That's an ant and us, what to speak of us and God. So that, that, I'm playing the devil's advocate, and what would you say to that? Because the ant is so small, he'll never understand you unless there's someone that instructs him says that what you're perceiving right now is very very great what it is this is a refrigerator and it's owned by so and so if he meditates upon it if he believes it if he's properly instructed about the truth then he'll understand to some degree and as he expands his consciousness then he'll realize more but if he speculates on his own, he'll never come to the conclusion because he's, his senses are too limited. That's a good answer. Okay, got it. So, so there has to be an intermediary. There has to be someone to explain how this all ties in. But without the intermediary, this ant's never going to get it. Or we, it's a, a much bigger distance between us and God, we're never going to get it without, I mean, just by studying the mountains and the rivers and the oceans, it doesn't seem like we can know much about God without that intermediary, that representative to help us to connect the dots. Otherwise, we'll never connect the dots on our own. Yes, I very much like the example sometimes we're talking about. I very much like the example that if there is five, I don't know, five blind men, five blind men, and they're all trying to figure out what an elephant is. They've never seen an elephant. They never came in contact with an elephant before. One is touching the trunk. He said, this is a tree. The other is touching his uh, leg. And Ramana says, Ji, I'm having a hard time hearing you. There's a background noise. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I kind of start over again? I, I, not just the, ro the rooster was fine, but it's another distracting noise. I couldn't, couldn't hear you. There's five blind men. They're, they've never come in contact with an elephant before. This is the first time. They've never seen an elephant. They're blind. They've never heard about an elephant. They just came in contact with them. One is holding the trunk. They said, oh, it's a tree. One is holding his leg and says, oh, it's a pillar. One is holding his tusk and saying, oh, it must be a, uh, a weapon of some kind. You know, they're touching different parts of his body and they have different speculations. They're not going to figure it out on their own. Hope somebody with eyes comes and says, this is an elephant. And he describes exactly what the thing is. He, they're exposed to the truth, and therefore they get knowledge of what the elephant really is. Similarly, with the Virata Purusha, if we simply under, try and figure it out on our own, because of our limited perception, limited area of uh, perceiving jurisdiction, we'll never come to the truth. But if we're guided, then that gives us some sort of an understanding so that we can go further. So it's mercy on those materialistic persons that, uh, can, that are only relying on their senses. So Vivarat is something you, all right, then meditate on the gross material manifestation. But in its truth, its relationship to the Supreme Lord as one of his energies. Good, good answer. Very well done. I, you know, I was thinking the same thing. I was, uh, 
I don't want to be too lengthy with my answer. I was thinking the, the same example of the, of the elephant and everyone feeling it and perceiving it differently. But, uh, and you answered that really well. It's someone there with eyes and they can explain it and will understand it. So otherwise, the, 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 the Virat Purush will, will never figure it out. Will never, will never get it. It would just be like that ant or those people feeling the elephant until there's a Shastra, Shastra Sadhu Guru there to explain that to us and then under the guidance of Shastra Sadhu Guru then actually there's a lot of artistic license one can take. I noticed in the verse, again I'm not in front of, uh, of the computer, but there was a sentence in there somewhere in the middle of the purport, maybe a little past the middle, where Prabhupada was saying that you can think of, you know, you can think of trees, you can think of the mountains, you can think of, of the demigods, you can think of the beast, or anything. And I remember reading elsewhere where oh, that was mentioned in a purport, you know, or anything. We can, I mean, any aspect of this material nature, we can see as part of the Virat Purush. That's part of that sort of a, a pantheistic conception and to start to perceive God through anything. And I think we could find anyone in, in any aspect of life because everyone has a, a different rasa with this material nature. Everyone has some interest or some, fascinate, some fascination with something. And if we can, I guess, guide them in whatever their fascination is to somehow see Krishna in there, to see that as this part of the Virat Purush with a little imagination, and because that is authorized by Shastra to use some imagination, to use some artistic license, then uh, because that's authorized, then uh, then one, the, the, the process of enlightenment begins. Very good. By the way, Yugalarasa, you, I don't have the ability to, to mute and unmute myself. You'll have to handle that on your end. Hello, Ramananda. Hi, Krishna. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Oh, my goodness. Now I'm really intimidated. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, was, I, I have the same opinion. It's also it's numeral. <laughs> yeah. Phenomenal and numeral. Yeah. Um, but it seems to be a really, a really kind of flexible word. You had, you had your, your uh, uh, you know, sources of, uh, of uh, definition for the thing and Kant and everybody else. And then uh, uh, Prabhuji and uh, the Narahari gave some nice definitions. Um, but one, another definition I've heard is that phenomenal world is, is the manifest world that we experience. And the numinal world is the causal world. So like we see like the, the room is all painted up, there are electrical outlets. That's the phenomena. And the numina, then is the people acting behind the scenes that we don't see that create it, you know. So, so it seems to be like people use the words, you know, with some flexibility. But yeah, definitely, you know, the thought. And then proper when he's using it, I shall now explain to you everything both phenomenal and numinal, knowing which nothing, nothing else shall remain to be known. I think the words that Prabhupada is passing are jnana vidyana, you know. So jnana means to know this world, and then vidyana means to know the, uh, the cause behind it in that sense. Yeah. So it's a very in interesting concept. So your, your presentation is very nice. Um, you're quoting from the Wiki Wikipedia. Uh, I don't know, do, do you subscribe to the Britannica? No, Maharaj. We rely on you for all these things. <laughs> <laughs> it's, only, it's only 50 bucks a year. And uh, when you're in you can look up you know, different things to read them. <laughs> you know, but but I, don't, I don't even have to. Right? I was just thinking, if you want to actually... Um, you know, for example, I have citations that you can use in, in full university settings. The Britannica is accepted, accepted by uh, by you know, uh, academic authorities as an authoritative source. They ask, and at Wikipedia sometimes some professors will immediately fail your paper immediately if you quote Wikipedia one time. You know, some people. They ask the um, the guy who directs the Britannica, as I've heard what he thought about the Wikipedia, and he laughed and he said, I use it, you know. He said, the Wikipedia is like the chisel, the Britannica is like the drill, you know. The Wikipedia has the advantage of covering a lot of stuff, doesn't have to be so rigorous, so it can be more, you know, investigate more. The Britannica, they try to be, try to be, you know, more specific. And also, they give you, uh, sometimes the uh, person who wrote the article, you know, so that's one point. Um, another thing is that, 
there's one verse, and I, I try to get it in my index, my notes, but I haven't got it. And it's somewhere, I think it's in the, the second canto, and maybe you know, maybe somebody knows. It's the one, the very famous one I've been told, where Father starts to go through, and he describes the, uh, the Astanga Yoga system. Like first you've got to get free from the sense objects, and you've got to get free from the senses, and you've got to get free from the mind, and you've got to get free from the intelligence. You know? And then he explains that just by this introspective process, one can come to the point of paramatma. You know? I said, but, but beyond that, to realize Bhagavan, he says, one needs a guru, one needs descending knowledge. So from that, uh, other things too, it seems that um, one can realize Brahman, but by the introspective process, he also can realize Paramatma. Now, Paramatma doesn't mean Bhagavan. Paramatma means that you begin to feel that there is a, a, a hand which intervenes in things, you know, that there is justice, that, you know, they're, they're, for example, maybe even a little mercy or something like that. But you don't know what it is, if it's, if it's an impersonal principle or anything else like that. So that Paramatma level, I mean, it's hard for devotees to realize this because we're all like, you know, Bhagavats. But as far as I understand, I wish they could find that problem saying that by introspective method one can come to realize also par Paramatma feature of the Lord. Yeah. Um, the elephant thing, I don't know if you ever looked at, look at the images, but if you look on the, 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 on the, on the, on the web there, if you put in like elephant blinding, you get some really fantastic uh, images, you know, to use in your preaching. And the ants are also the same thing without higher guidance. And if, if the light comes on, the ants aren't very intelligent, you know. So, so but if the lights come on all of a sudden, then the ants, they, they don't know what's going on. They maybe can just distinguish on off. But it gives them some realization that there's some fantastic thing higher than us, you know. Maybe that's about as much as they're going to realize about God is that God is great. There's something more powerful than us. I thought it was all powerful. So the same thing, this with their intelligence, they can begin to realize something about the absolute. You know? Every every form of life is for education. That's what I, I would suggest. Um, and finally, uh, there's this song by uh, Leonard Cohen, Hallelujah. And it's really nice to listen to the thing and analyze it. Um, it's been sung by, practically speaking, almost every single major artist in the world. You know, the Wikipedia says that there are over 300 uh, known uh, renditions of the song, and many times it's the cover song for, you know, for an album. And of course, it even appeared in Shrek. You know? And so <laughs> you see, you see, it, you listen as a devotee, you listen to why is this popular? And it's awesome because the holy name is there. You know, the holy name is there. You supposedly rewrote it like 80 times, you know. And you really can see like a certain level of development. It's, but a lot of it seems to be the holy name is in the mode of passion. The mode of ignorance is get God giving you something gross. The mode of passion is more like some knowledge coming, some perspective, but really being honest about the fact that I want to approach you for my things, but not gross things, subtle things. Fruity activities described in poetic language, you know, so on. So I would say he's the same thing. He hasn't got a guru in, in that sense. And I'm having a guru, because we all have a guru. I mean, Waita Charya is everybody's guru, you know. But I would say having a guru means specifically... You know, uh, taking shelter of an acharya, hearing from him, and then then taking initiation. You know, and so until that point, you know, you can't realize Bhagavan. But but by the ambience and by Krishna's mercy and the brought we and everything else, it seems that yeah, we can realize that there is a reality. That's Brahman. There is a reality. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and it has form. It has relationships. There's rules and and stuff like that. And maybe you can begin to feel, see the hand of a God or the hoof of a God or, or whatever like that in nature. So thank you very much. This is my, my comments. Hare Krishna. Am I unmuted? Yes. Mara, that was wonderful. Actually, I, we just heard on Sunday, Ravinda Sharif was giving a class on the 11th Canto, and he did mention this, um, that... Uh, at the utmost, through the empiric, um, through empiricism, it is possible to come up to the Paramatma realization. As the, I, I've heard that once or twice before, but I don't know much about it. But uh, that just like, confirms not not only uh, Brahman realization, but for some, it may be possible to actually have. 
paramount my realization to some degree. So that was interesting. The verse that Maharaj is referring to, um, it's interesting in, in the Bhagavad Gita verse. I believe that's Jnanam Teham Sivigyanam Adam Vaksham Sheshata Yaj Gyatva Nehabuyan Yaj Gyatam Yam Abhishishate. It's, work, it's interesting, Krishna says that, so now I'll explain to you, Jnanam Teham Sivigyanam, both phenomenal and numinal knowledge, um, fully, Vasheshata. Um, Yaj Gyatva Nehabuyan Yaj, and one who fully understands both phenomenal and numinal, then Gyatavyam Abhishishate. There, there, there's, there's nothing more to be known. Yaj Gyatva Nehabuyan Yaj Gyatam Yam Abhishishate. Yes, there's, there's nothing. There's nothing more to be known. If we know the phenomenal and we know the noumenal, we've got it all. Of course, understanding the noumenal in its, in its highest sense, of course, is understanding God as, as the ultimate uh, uh, noumenal phenomena. Yeah, are you, uh, can you hear me? Windows are shut. That's really loud. Yeah. Sorry. What can I do? What is it? Driving to the point. Um. All right. Well, then, thank you very much, Prabhu. I, I have no idea who was on today, but for anybody that attended, thank you very much for your kind attention. And especially thank you to Dr. Prabhu and Hanma Prashek Swami for your comments. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. 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 See everybody tomorrow. Hi, Bo. Jai. 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 Jai.